We truly are the best party on campus. To all of our off-campus uh, visitors, welcome to Whitewater. And I would like to extend a special, very heartfelt thank you to all of our local sponsors, including individuals from both the Jefferson and Walworth County Republican parties, as well as Robert and Patricia Herbold for again, allowing us to host such a historical event on campus. And finally, thank you to Young America's Foundation for their continued sponsorship, partnership, and most importantly, their friendship. The people at YAF are the best in the business and are allied with our organization in efforts to spread the conservative message far and wide across campuses across the country. So many of you know that our country is deeply divided. President Biden has clearly failed in his promise to heal that divide. Over the past several years, our country has not only continued to become more and more divided, but as students here on a college campus, this has become more and more evident to us with each passing day. What was once the hallowed ground for the formation and the sharing of ideals and values has become a place where conservatives like you and I are constantly and frequently find ourselves up against an ever-increasing blockade, a blockade of liberal tactics and smears. We find ourselves shouted down and shut up, but we will not be silenced. It seems as though everywhere you go, contention and anger mark a bitter divide that strives to separate us from those whose ideals differ from ours. But it does not have to be like this. There is another way. I'm proud to say that for the past several decades, the UW-Whitewater College Republicans have been fighting back against that narrative, providing a place for all individuals, and especially those who have views that differ from ours, to come to discuss the issues of the day in a civil and productive environment, and most importantly, to find some common ground. It's not just you and I who see something going on here. There are many people in our community, people in our state, and people across the country who realize that we are facing a divided America. Today, I'm proud to welcome a special guest to campus, someone who has stood up and stared down a divided America, someone who has stood up for America and stood by the man who brought peace and made America great again. In 2016, she rose into the national sphere after managing the historic come from behind campaign of President Donald J. Trump, becoming the first woman to successfully run and to win a presidential campaign in the history of the United States of America. She later worked in the White House as an assistant and senior counselor to the president. She now makes regular appearances on cable TV, manages her own polling company, and will be releasing a new book, Here's the Deal, on May 24th. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm Warhawk welcome to the Honorable Kellyanne Conway. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. Wow, what a great looking crowd, thank you. John, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I understand some of you have been in your seats since 5.30 and I appreciate that. Tom Joanna is with me. Is with me. Um, I say in my book. I thank him in my book for riding shotgun and often taking the wheel. Four years in the White House, the campaign before that, and now in the private sector together. And he was driving the rental car on the way here, and we we're literally just about to step out. And I saw my code on the phone meant it was President Trump's cell phone. And he literally called and he's talking. He said, "Wait, I have to call you back." I said, "What are we going to do?" He's going to call me back in the middle of it, and then he's going to want to talk to you, which he would have liked. And so I waited and he called back and we talked. I said, by the way, I'm in Wisconsin. How's Wisconsin doing? Do they like me there? And I said, I'll ask them. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, it's great to be with you for many different reasons. And uh, John, I really appreciated reading about you before I came because what happened to you happened to me many, many moons ago, about 35 years ago almost, when I returned from a year abroad at Oxford University in England and I was going to college in Washington, D.C. And we had no college Republican or college Democratic club to speak of. It made no sense to me. Went to an all-women's Catholic college. And I thought there have to be people like me on both sides of the aisle who in part chose this college because it's in Washington, D.C. It's in the nation's capital where there are internship opportunities and congressional or Supreme Court opportunities to go and witness and absorb. So I asked my friend if she would start the Democratic uh, College Democrats, start it back up. 
And I and I said I would do the College Republicans with my friend Maureen. And we were all set to do that, but we ran into a problem that the College Democrats did not have heading into the 1988 presidential race. We couldn't find a single faculty member to be our advisor and to be recognized by the school, by the by the college, and to have access to any type of resources, a couple of dollars here or there to have an event or maybe some refreshments, or of course, a speaker's fee, a pot for the speakers, we had nothing like that. We weren't even going to be able to reserve a room on the campus, if you can imagine. And I felt like my mom, my single mom, and my student loans were paying an awful lot for me to go to college that we should have been able to reserve a room. Fast forward, I couldn't find anyone. There were a lot of nuns on campus. None of them would touch it. They literally said, they said, how was your year in Oxford? Does that say Republican? And they wouldn't, they wouldn't help us. But this professor, Ira Reed, and he prided himself. He looked like he had gone from Woodstock right onto the campus. Did not stop go, did not, did not collect $200. And he, he said, you know what? I'm not a Republican. I don't really know any. I don't really care for any. He said, but um, I think that your right to assembly and to speech is much more important than my political beliefs. And I'll always be grateful to him for that because when I, by the time we graduated a year and a half later, the College Republican Club was the largest club on campus. And it tells you something. It tells you really two things. And we're right back there decades later. It tells you, number one, that if you build it, they do come. And it tells you, it really suggests how many people are open to that message that you don't even realize in your circle of life. You figure, oh no, my cousin, she's such a liberal, my roommate, oh, if I look at that Obama poster one more time, or my, the in-laws at Thanksgiving, it goes on and on and on. But really, did you ever listen to what they're talking about? Lots of them sound conservative, they just call themselves something else. Okay. Tells you one, there are people who are open to this message. If you build it, there will be more and more people. Look at you, look at you in here. Number two, it tells you something else. It tells you all you need to know about why the hard left wants to stop you and take out your voice box and make you look the other way when you see injustices against conservatives and free speech and big tech censorship and the rest of it. They're afraid. They're afraid of everyone in this room. You never need to be afraid of them. They are afraid of you. I promise you they're afraid of you because you're on the right side of so many issues. You know, 60 years ago, we had... Southern Democratic governors, bigoted people, standing in the schoolhouse door, preventing kids of color from coming into the schoolhouse. And now all across this country, we have bigoted Democrats everywhere, standing in the schoolhouse door, preventing kids of all backgrounds from coming out of the schoolhouse and going and pursuing an education that is worthy of them. You're on the right side of that issue. I may know two of you in this entire room. I know you're on the right side of school choice, charter schools, opportunity scholarships, and educational freedom. And you know who agrees with you now? Who maybe three years ago did not, and maybe five years ago had never really thought much about it? Many parents. Because for two school years, screen time became school time. And they know better. They know screen time is not school time. They wanted their kids back on the campuses. They wanted them back in the classrooms. And when Glenn Youngkin won in Virginia and Jack Chitterelli, who I saw last night in New Jersey, came really close to New Jersey. If you go and look at even the Democratic focus groups that were done, they discovered that it wasn't just critical race theory or um, masks on young kids. It was actually the larger issue of everybody bought into March to June 2020, um, get off of campus to stay home, you know, try to slow down the spread. But then we had a fairly good summer and then the next school year started and they said, oh, I'm sorry, you have to start on the computer again. And the parents knew which political party wanted that and which one did not want that. There was a bright line distinction and it tells you something about it, doesn't it? That if you try to mush it up, people never know the difference and they'll go to their natural resting place, which is I'm a liberal, I'm a progressive, I'm a Democrat. You have to show that bright line distinction. And the Democrats who for years, decades, have had a huge advantage over Republicans on the issue of which party do you trust more to handle the issue of education, we are now within seven points of them. It was minus 18, minus 20, minus 22. But people are paying attention. You're on the right side of that. 
But don't, don't lose the forest for the trees. Critical race theory is a very important issue. We should, treat, we should teach kids to love America, not to hate America and each other. It's very simple. Yes, very simple. And of course, we shouldn't have masks on second graders outside on the playground in 2022. Of course, all of that is true. But don't lose this opportunity. It's all of our opportunity. It's a nationwide opportunity. It's a Wisconsin opportunity. It's an opportunity Wisconsin has taken before. But it's actually your opportunity because you have something I'll never have again. The future. You've got more of the future than anyone else around. So it's your opportunity to make sure you're broadening the conversation into charter school, school choice, that parents have a right to say where their children go to school and what is taught there. How is that controversial? How in God's name is an entire political party against what I just said? And speaking of God, we like him. We don't think he's a four-letter word. We're willing to... Respect people's religious freedom, their liberty. I'm very proud to have worked for a president. More on him in a second. Very proud to have worked for a president who was the first president in the history of the U.S. to go to the United Nations General Assembly in September of 2019 and give a major speech on religious liberty, calling China out on the Uyghurs, calling out the beheading of the Coptic Christians, calling out everybody in public squares, in, on cappuccino counters, all the way to large countries with more than a billion people in them, calling them all out and saying, the first right that each of us has is our right to practice religion freely and as we wish. And that is under attack every single day. Now you're on the right side of a couple of other issues. On the matter of border security and immigration, do you realize more Americans and more Wisconsinites now say that immigration and border security is an important issue to them than when Donald Trump was the president? And I looked at that first, I scratched my head. Part of it is because he made it an issue, and secondly, because they knew it was better managed then. But ladies and gentlemen, whether you learn it in the history books or someone skips over, the fact is this, this country has spent billions of dollars over decades to protect the borders and the sovereignties of countries all over the world. Is it so difficult that we would want to protect our own sovereignty and our own borders? And Donald Trump was right. If you don't have borders, you don't have a country. This country, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. (laughs) This country is the most generous country in the history of the world to legal immigrants. Over 34 million people have come here that way. Some of them, perhaps your own family members, I'm sure. It's not compassionate to tell people to swim through the Rio Grande to have their children running across in the middle of the night. How is that compassionate? It's not compassionate to have 7,000 people here a day. And right now, as we speak, including here in Wisconsin, the number one killer, the number one cause of death for 18 to 44-year-olds in this country is fentanyl. And President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump celebrated their birthday yesterday. God bless you. Long may you live, Melania. Um, They brought those drug overdose deaths down for the first time in 30 years. Uh, And they worked on that public policy issue together. I had a ringside seat. They did a phenomenal job doing that. Prevention, education, treatment, recovery, law law enforcement, interdiction. The two political parties were always doing one or the other. They did them all, amazing accomplishments. And in fact, President Trump signed into law in October of 2018, the largest single piece of legislation on any one drug crisis in our nation's history. Six billion dollars in investments, but every single Democrat voted for it. That's what I want you to know. You've probably never heard that before because it doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah, he just raised his eyes. In your MAGA hat, every, every single Democrat voted for it. Every single Democrat, of the following list, if they sound familiar to you, Tim Ryan, Beto O'Rourke, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Tulsi Gabbard. You may say they all sound like a bunch of socialists. Well, they you would be mostly right, but you know who they are? They all ran against Donald Trump for president, and they all voted for that legislation because they all see the need in their own states. 
And even one Republican senator voted against it and 13 Republicans in the House. Every single Democrat voted for it. And Donald Trump's the president who signed it into law. And now, latest numbers under Joe Biden, 106,000 overdose deaths. It's just unacceptable, ladies and gentlemen. When you hear one death, it ruins just, it affects hundreds of lives. And it's, the government has a lot of resources, time, talent, treasure. You're relying upon them. They work for you. Demand better because you are better and you deserve better. I want to tell a couple stories about Wisconsin. I'm going to talk about issues again, but I'm going to tell, tell a couple stories about Wisconsin. So in 2016, Donald Trump makes me an offer to be campaign manager. And I said, wow. The, uh, the self-denying South Jersey girl raised by four Italian Catholic women in a house of self-denying women, absolutely lovely, but very self-denying. Um, I knew I was going to sabotage myself, but somehow I, made, I got to yes. But Wisconsin was a big part of our conversation that day. And it was a big part of our conversation many days after that. Why? Because that day, President Trump, uh, Mr. Trump asked me, can we still win this thing? And I said, Sure. I said, you're running against the most miserable person in presidential political history. Fact check true. Her, not with her. Um, I said, and we can't be resembling her. What's going on? And so we talked about it. And he said, what do you recommend? I had been waiting for that moment for many years because the gift of my life professionally apart from the obvious of being the campaign manager and working in the White House for you, for all of you in this country, I love so deeply. It's been so great to each and every one of us and the freedoms that it gives us. But yes. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Someone's clapping. Apart from that, the gift of my professional life is being a professional pollster, survey researcher, um, quantitative, of course, and then focus group moderator, the qualitative research. I literally have been to all 50 states doing projects, literally. So I respect the essential wisdom of the American people. The best responses and ideas that I've ever heard have come from the people. You're supposed to be giving them to the people through advertisements and speeches and slogans and marketing campaigns, and we do that. But so much of it originated from the people. Why? Because you think about these things every day. You're living through them. If we put you in charge, we took your representatives out of Washington or Madison, and we put you in charge for a couple of days, things would look measurably different. We know that. So I was ready for that moment. But what I shared with Mr. Trump, I had really shared with some of the Romney people. I shared with some of the McCain people. I shared with some of the, a lot of the people. So I didn't think it was particularly unique or genius. The difference was Donald Trump was willing to try it. That was the difference. And that's another lesson for all of us. Just because everybody says you can't do that, you can't win, it's not gonna work, nobody's ever tried that, that's stupid, why would you think of that? You hear this all the time. Say thank you very much and go forward. Thank you very much for nothing and go forward. And so he said, I said, Mr. President, Mr. Trump, there are a couple of things we need to do, but one, I very much believe the blue wall is real. The blue wall, of course, begins and ends here in Wisconsin. The blue wall was real. Hillary had the benefit of the blue wall. I said, we have to bust through the blue wall. And this is also why I recommended um, either a Governor Pence or Governor Walker as, as his running mate, because I very much believed that you have to go to the Midwest or the Rust Belt, the upper Midwest or the Rust Belt, and find somebody who is known there, who has governed there, who understands the issues there, and, and put them on the ticket. But that day, I said to him, listen, let's, let's focus on the 10 or 12 states that Biden, uh, that Obama Biden carried by more than 50% of the vote twice, where Hillary Clinton is nowhere over 50% and staying there in any legitimate polls. And number three, maybe most importantly, where that state elected a Republican statewide to Senate or governor while Obama's been president. That's the key there. So you're not allergic to Republicans. So that was, that was actually a lot of states because they won a lot of states against Romney and McCain. So um, that was uh, North Carolina or Florida. Uh, that was, uh, my goodness, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, Nevada. It was many states. 
And so Pennsylvania, Ohio. And so he said, well, tell me more. So fast forward, I become the campaign manager on a Friday. By Tuesday, we're having a meeting in a big Trump Tower conference room. He's not there. He's on the road. He's probably here, actually. And uh, he's in Wisconsin. We're in there. And Katie Walsh, who was chief of staff to RNC chairman Reince Priebus at the time, another Wisconsin favorite son, did this big presentation. We had about 30 people around. She said, Kellyanne, we just want to give you the benefit of the data and the modeling that we already have. I said, we'll take it. Terrific. I sat there. I watched notes. They put, you know, mortar boards up everywhere. We were going on and on. She said, I hate to say this. We went through the whole electoral map. She said, I hate to say this, and I know that you're new to this job, but if I were you, I would consider pulling out of Virginia. I said, wow, when did that happen in Virginia? And I said, I don't know. Mr. Trump owns uh, properties there. He feels like he can, you know, go there a few times for rallies. We'll see what happens. She said, I would pull out of Virginia. It's just hard with the whole D.C. Bellway. I said, but what's going on in Wisconsin? I said, I love Wisconsin, but, you know, we're way behind there. And she said, Wisconsin will always have a big footprint and a big money investment in Wisconsin because the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, is from Wisconsin. The Chairman of the RNC, Ryan Spreepers, is from Wisconsin. Um, we just won, you know, three out of four, or, or, or I think Scott Walker was elected, you know, three times in five years or whatnot. And, and so there were a lot of investments in ground game and whatnot. She said, and the most competitive Senate seat this year, Ron Johnson, sounds familiar, um, in 2016, is in Wisconsin. So she says, so we'll always have a footprint there. I filed it in the front of my brain and it came in handy when your former governor, the great Tommy Thompson called me one day about a month and a half after he called me the first time. The first call was on mid-September. He said, Kellyanne, as much as I would love for Donald Trump and Mike Pence and everybody to come back to Wisconsin, the polls are really, it's like 24 points. Like we're really way down. And I, I would love to tell you, I said, you know, Governor, I appreciate that because mostly people usually say, oh, come to my state. I'll help you win. Here's my Rolodex. I know... I said, I appreciate your candor. I do. I see the same polls I know. Then he called me and he said, it's time to come back. And uh, because he he said, if it's ever, I said, Governor, if they're ever closing, if you see something different, you know, we'll, he said, it's time to come back. And sure enough, what's the secret sauce? None. Just showing up and standing up and speaking up and doing what Hillary Clinton didn't do. She was playing around in Georgia and Arizona and Texas. I'm going to turn Texas blue. She did because they were bored to death by the time she finished the speech. (laughs) But it stayed red politically, and red it still is. Um, And so I think it's uh, not being arrogant or ignorant, actually, about voters and about your own candidacy. And, of course, Wisconsin, they call Wisconsin in 2016, and President Trump is the winner by 23,000 votes here. 2020, they call Wisconsin by about 21,000 votes for Joe Biden. So sure, John and his introduction, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. We're divided. Wisconsin's divided. The country's divided. Your families are divided. I got it. But this country was founded on that. This country was founded on that. And we're resilient. We will survive that. Democracy will survive. America will survive. The question is, how do we make conservatism thrive? That's really the question. And you do that, in my view, through policies and ideas. Policies, not personalities. Principles more than politics. Ideas more than any one individual. There's a reason our presidents are term limited. There's a reason we're all term limited, God says. These ideas, these principles need to be timeless and survive all of us. And now is really the time when you have people's attention, when they are suffering They're angry at the Biden-Harris administration. Young people are abandoning him. The latest poll shows his approval rating among young people has gone down 19 points from a year ago. 19 points. Do you know that's called causation, not coincidence? Just like when I look at Kamala Harris's approval rating and it was uh, 28%. I mean, there must be a lot, some Democrats in there if it's 28%. And people say, that's sexism sexism or racism. And I say, no, that's eyesight and hearing. (laughs) She earned it. She earns it every day. You know, it would be so funny to say all they do is lie. You want to watch people lie for a living? My goodness. Everything's fine in Afghanistan. No Americans will be stranded. The, uh, The border surge is seasonal. 
Inflation is transitory. We're going to kill the virus. Okay? Those aren't gaffes. Come on. Those are lies. And they only work if you're as stupid as they hope you are and, think, and frankly think you are. So they're not gaffes. But in addition, what were we also told about our administration? Chaos. There's chaos. Chaos in the Trump White House today. More, more on that in a moment. Here's our chaos correspondent to tell you more about the chaos in the Trump White House. Chaos where? In a tweet? In an offhand remark about someone? Now there's chaos everywhere you look. There's chaos in Ukraine and worse. Chaos at the border. Chaos at the gas pump. Chaos in the grocery store. Chaos in the supply chain. Chaos in these increases in crime in our major cities, including here in Wisconsin. Chaos at the ballot box. So that's real chaos. That's consequential chaos you have now. And I think Biden, listen, I get it. I have eyes and ears too. But everybody sees what you see. Even the people who couldn't get enough of the DSM, psychoanalyzing Donald Trump from their non-medical armchair you know, places and spaces. Where is the DSM now? You got to dust that sucker off and go to some page and tell us what's going on with Joe Biden. But here's what's really going on with Joe Biden. He has the trifecta of negative polling. The country has lost confidence in his competence completely. Even the CNN and NBC polls show that. Number two, his disapproval rating is over 60% and at or close to 60% disapproval on all the top key issues. COVID, which used to be his number one issue in handling, the economy, inflation, jobs, which he says he created the record number. Nobody cares if you have all these jobs, if you have no money, or you can't get basic goods and services. Crime, his approval rating on all of that is terrible. And then he has what I think is a big blow to a Democratic president because it, didn't, it never happened to Bill Clinton, it never happened to Barack Obama, and they suffered grievous losses in their midterm elections. In 1994, Bill Clinton, in his first year, Bill Clinton, they lo the Democrats lost 52 seats in the House, control of the House, the Senate, governorship, state houses. It was just a remarkable sweep at the contract with America. And one of my mentors, Newt Gingrich, I was a baby pollster working on that at the time. And then in 2010, Barack Obama suffers 63 seat loss in the House and calls it a shellacking, but they both went on to be reelected president, Clinton and Obama. And just this week, Biden is suffering a death of a thousand cuts from the inside. It's coming from inside the House, the White House for sure, but the Democratic House, definitely. Elizabeth Warren's out there running already. Pete Buttigieg, I mean, he's got those if he's not telling us to get an electric car, he's got those two big SUVs that drive him to the White House complex and they dropped him off with his bicycle and helmet. <laughs> Anybody see this? You can roll the tape, go home tonight and do this. And he biked from there to here <laughs> because at the White House complex, I know for sure all the cameras are there. So he went from there to here, but somebody had the camera on before that and after that, as they usually do, and saw him get out of the SUV, jump on the bike, and then they put the bike back in and he went inside. I mean, that's just not, that's not just silly. It's just hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. You want to drive an electric car? Drive an electric car. You never want to drive again? Don't drive again. It's America. Do what you want. But don't tell me what you want me to do and then don't go do it, not do it yourself. That's all. It's very simple. <laughs> and here's why I think young people are leaving Biden and the Democrats right now. It's not just because their major leaders are all sort of old white people, like Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton, who still hasn't conceded the other election. <laughs> Not to be confused with George's Stacey Abrams, who still hasn't conceded the other election. Uh, here's why I think young people are, are leaving them. Apart from the fact that they're smart, young people call themselves independents more than Republicans or Democrats. So what does it mean to be an independent? It means you don't really trust politicians and government. 
government's part of the problem, not the solution. And that you're looking, you really are open to hearing about the ideas. And what happened the last couple of years? I call it life interrupted. All of these polls of Gen Z say the same thing. Having a harder time just forming and retaining relationships, uh, uh, platonic relationships, academic relationships, romantic relationships, just having a harder time, mental health, emotional well-being. It's everywhere. It's everyone. And we know why that happened. To say nothing of life interrupted with academic progress and careers and and of course, a poll just released this, this week saying that all the financial burdens now have prevented young people from doing other things that they want to do, that they freely want to choose to do. Buy their first home or condo and maybe go to graduate school, maybe start saving or investing. And it's all because of this. It's all because of this. And it will be better because you are better and you deserve better. But now's the chance for you to bring this message to so many other people who are truly open to it, truly open to it. And speaking of Scott Walker, I'm here for YAF and he's the president. And uh, I have to tell you, if you weren't around then or you don't remember, go back and just read the history of his election and then his election again and then overcoming the recall and then his reelection. And watch, yes, watch watch what he did. I know I was in a hotel room somewhere we need to do focus groups in, in somewhere, I think actually out West. And I was watching because I was behind in the time zone. I was watching and people had gone into the state capitol in Madison and they were ripping down the cornices. And the decorator, I thought, wow, the media is going to be very sorry that they're there trying to embarrass Scott Walker and other people because they're catching their own co-conspirators, ripping, you know, destroying this building, this beautiful building, your state capitol. Shine a light on the left. It never looks good after a while. And the other good thing that happened this week, I think for young people and freedom lovers, is the genius Elon Musk bought Twitter. Yes. Which means Twitter will be fun again and free again and fair again. And I know a thing or two about Twitter. I know a thing or two about, I have a, two major men in my life love to tweet. <laughs> Which means I don't. People would say, you got to stop Donald Trump from tweeting. He's got to stop tweeting, Kelly. And if anybody can do it, you can do it. They told me this on the campaign. They told me this during transition. They told me while he was president. They told me while he wasn't president. They told me recently, and he hasn't been on Twitter in 15 months. He's got to stop tweeting. Well, why would I do that? Put a fake bluebird on his phone. If you just do that, then he, you know, doing that to him. Why would I do that? He figured out how to be president. You didn't. I didn't. So let him tweet. So I finally just came up with like a standard response I'll share with him. Like, listen, he needs to tweet like we need to eat. It's just about better choices. (laughs) (laughs) And I will tell you, some days he was eating the kale salad and other days he was finishing the brownies. And uh, <laughs> as we all do, as we all do, guilty. One time he, uh, I write in my book how you know, was, Tom said, the president would like to see you. So I said, okay, ready for this. Give me that folder. You know, I'm very organized. I have it all tabbed. I'm ready. Like, what are the things I need to review with him? What did he ask me to look up for him? What is he going to, what do I anticipate he's going to ask me about the news today? So I go in there. Good morning, Mr. President. And he's sitting there. He's looking at his phone over there at the Resolute desk. And he says, oh, good morning. Calls me honey. Calls a lot of people honey. Hello, feminist. I don't really care what you think about that. I thought it was adorable and endearing. Um, I've been called worse <laughs> by the feminists. <laughs> great, a great boss for working moms, by the way. Um, and so I said, um, he said, I have my folder. I'm going to sit down in front of him. And he said, did you like my tweet? <laughs> Looking around for help. I said, no one else there. And I said, your tweet? I said, you know, Mr. President, it takes me 12 seconds to get here in three inch heels did I miss it? And he said, I found I missed many of them, by the way. Missed lots of Georges for sure. Um, And I said, uh, I said, did I miss it? And he said, oh, and then he told me the tweet. And I said, oh, that one from this morning. 
Yeah, no, I wasn't going to mention it, but it wasn't in my top 1,000 most favorite. He said, oh. And he said, well, so-and-so liked it. I said, well, here are the ones that I do like. I like when you tell America what's happening, what you're considering today, what you're working on, where you're going to travel next, what head of state is coming, what issues you're going to tackle next month, next week. And you know why I like that, ladies and gentlemen? Because those tweets are not really about someone else. They're about you. They're for you. And Donald Trump did something transformative to the United States presidency that historians will write about, I'm convinced, because historians, some of the historians who will write about Donald Trump's presidency have not even been born yet. So all the critics and the naysayers and the ankle biters and the tweeters and the critic, you know, all these people who don't wear pants that snap button or zipper anymore who have a thing to say about all of us, you'll think about that later. <laughs> Everybody looks down at their pants and says, oh. Everybody who literally does not leave the house still, got nothing to do with the pandemic, uh, let them all talk. The president transformed information for you. I call it the democratization of information. Every single person in this room, in this country, in the world, had immediate and free of charge access to a presidential communication. Imagine that. Do you deserve anything less than that? No. <laughs> Transparency. Instant communication. Sometimes, you know, we really didn't need to know all of it. I admit, but uh, really just terrifically done. And now we certainly don't have that. We don't have a lot of stuff. But you know what we also don't have? I'll tell you what. In the White House where I worked, nobody ever had to wonder who was really the president, who was in charge, and what he was thinking, for sure. <laughs> now, this thing about being a divided country, of course we are. You can help in that, too. You don't have to compromise your principles. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to be the first one to go toward the middle. No, that's not what that's about. That's about finding the places where you do agree and finding the people who agree with you and don't even realize it because they haven't thought much about it. Got pro-choicers in your life? Maybe we have some in this room. I bet you, I'm just going to bet you not even knowing you or them, that you're pro-choice and you're not pro-abortion in the eighth and ninth month. I'm going to bet you don't think that taxpayers should pay for it any more than they should pay for Viagra. Did she say that? Yes. Same thing. Same idea. No, that's, yes. I don't think we should pay for it. A lot, most Americans think that you make your choice and you pay for it or you find a way to pay for it. If you're pro-choice in this room, somebody in your life is pro-choice, ask them this question. Can you name a single abortion that you think is a bad idea? You have one? Have you ever thought about it that way? Can you think of one circumstance, one individual, one pregnancy, just one scenario? since you're so filled with them for us, for the pro-lifers, can you think of one where abortion's not a good idea? Like, well, a woman's right to choose. Well, rape and I didn't ask that. I've heard that. I'm an old woman. I've heard that many times for many years, for many decades. They don't have an answer for you, so ask the question. Turn it around. The way candidate Trump said to Hillary Clinton, you're the extremist on abortion. You would rip that baby out of its mother's womb an hour before it's born, October 19, 2016. And America went, ugh. And I went, yes. She wasn't ready for that. Nobody had ever challenged her on that. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this work for decades. All I hear about is women's issues, women's issues, women's issues, women's issues. That's a euphemism for abortion. All issues are women's issues. I have never once in 35 years of doing this heard the term men's issues. So ladies, all issues are women's issues. You're on the right side of that. Even the New York Times has had to admit in two or three front page stories, now two above the fold, about all the in vitro surgeries that work, working on the baby while still in the womb about the babies that are born who survive abortions, about the babies that are born 21, 22, 23 weeks, going to have very healthy, full lives. You're on the right side of that. And I love how the same people wanted us to follow the science, put the mask on the five-year-olds, 
don't know what they see in a five-month-old sonogram. It's like, uh, it could be a heartbeat. Does look a little bit like a person. Come on, follow the science. Then follow the science. Tell them. You wanted me to follow the science for two years with my mask? Follow the science when you see that sonogram. I'm tired of the stories of the alienated youth, the apathetic youth, the angry youth. You know, they pick all these A words. I don't see it that way at all. I think you're spectacular. And I'm very happy. Yes, I'm very happy that our future is in your hands. So what can you do about it? I think that you need what I call the seven-second version, the 70-second version, the seven-minute version. Why I fight for freedom. Why I'm a conservative or a libertarian. Why I care. Why I show up and speak up and stand up. Why I believe X. Why I believe Y. Why I don't really care much about Z. Tell people. Don't be afraid to tell them. The magic of 2016 was, as predicted, the hidden undercover Trump voter. You know what? They weren't embarrassed to tell pollsters or each other they were voting for Trump. They just didn't look to type. Oh, but I'm a woman. I'm supposed to vote for. I'm supposed to vote for Hillary Clinton, the woman. No, yeah, it's okay. I'm Hispanic. Don't Republicans hate? No. I'm voting for Donald Trump. I'm young. Aren't I supposed to be with a party of youth and energy that has somehow Joe Biden as its president? <laughs> you know why people weren't telling? Because they didn't want every night to feel like Thanksgiving with the in-laws. They just don't want to get in arguments. But winning finishes a lot of sentences. And you're winning on these issues. You are winning on these issues. I don't care if you're ever politically motivated or inclined or active. What's important is that you're there for the principles and the policies. And ladies and gentlemen, it begins and ends with freedom. What is the point? of having our first female vice president of the United States, if the women in Afghan don't have the same rights they had before she got there. What is the point of having some guy who's been in Washington for five decades, so at least you say to yourself, okay, I'll soothe and comfort myself knowing that all the world leaders in the countries know him, they can deal with him, he'll get things done, yeah. If the Taliban took over, like that. In a moment's notice, 13 service members killed Taliban in $85 billion worth of equipment and technology within China's wingspan. America first is right, because it means freedom. <laughs> Let me end where I began, because I want to take your questions, if you'll have me. Let me end where I began. You, you got to make a list of moms, sisters, friends, cousins, of people dad worked with years ago, of folks that you kind of heard out of the court, some of you read about. Go and approach them. I'd like, a, I'd like an internship. I'd like an apprenticeship. I'd like a job. I'd like to have coffee with you. We were all interns and assistants, and everybody has always been in that position. Some people didn't like when they were, thought it was beneath them. They're going to say no, and then you really know who they are. Who needs them? Most will love it. And they will get as much out of that meeting or that engagement as you do. I promise. Don't be afraid. Winners are people who are willing to lose. You've got to risk loss to really win. Don't be afraid. You know who you are. And I heard John give the introduction. I hear this everywhere I go on campuses. I read it in the darn paper every day. I know it's real. You know why people call you names? You know why they don't want you to gather and speak and exchange ideas? I told you they're afraid of you. But there's another reason. They've accelerated now. They want to call you names so they never have to call you by your name. Because to give you a name means you're a real person, a free thinker, an individual, God's child, worthy of dignity and freedom of thought. 
and self-designation. That's what scares them, that you are impervious to what they're trying to do. Whether it's on the college campus, in the town square, in our churches, synagogues, and mosques, or anywhere at all. That's why you are the best ambassadors moving forward. People will look at you, they'll say, I like you, and you're like me. That's the connective tissue we all have with each other. Find it in each other, they'll say, I like you, which is easy to figure out. But the are you like me is the even more important question. Okay, okay, I know you do that whole yaff thing. Okay, okay, I know you say you're a conservative. I like you, so what do you mean? There's your chance. Just like when Donald Trump said, do you think we can win this thing? How? I'm like, here's my chance. I can blow it or I can go. Don't blow it. You've got the answers right there. You've been waiting to tell people for a long time. You've been waiting for that individual in your life to be open to it. There's nothing less than saving the Republic at stake than for you to actually do that. Happy to take your questions. God bless you and thank you for having me. So thank you again, Kellyanne, for coming tonight. Of course. Um, so there's a lot of talk about the Republican Party that they should move away from Trump in 2024. I personally don't see this happening, but do you think this is happening or do you think Trump will play an important role in the future? Sure. So whether Donald Trump runs for president again is up to Donald Trump. There are a lot of considerations that go into that. But I think more fundamentally, the question is, what happens to the 74 million Americans who voted for him? Um, and whoever runs for president, if he chooses to, he would be the nominee. If he chooses not to, it's got to be somebody who's running on the same issues, who's able to elevate issues like trade and immigration that were mired in single digits in all the polling and elevate them in a way that everybody's talking about them and expecting performance and results and got that. Um, it's, also, it's also a matter of understanding that the reason many people don't want him back is because they fear the rematch with Biden. So if you actually have to, you know, Biden won because he wasn't Trump. So now Biden's biggest threat really is somebody who stands up, doesn't drool, and isn't Biden. <laughs> that could be a lot of people, but I personally think it has to be somebody with a message. And the one thing I will say that President Trump has going for him, he has many things going for him, but the one thing I think he has going for him in 2024 is this. Americans typically will say, when things are this bad, when we're paying this much for gas, when we're, when we're hurting economically, when, when we feel insecure and uncertain in so many different ways, Americans will say, this is America. It will be better. It will get better. We're resilient. We're hardy. We just have to wait. Be patient. You know what Americans are saying right now? They're skipping right past that now, and they're saying, it was better. It was better not that long ago. Get it back. So that's something he has going for him. But um, I think that there will be, if, he does, if President Trump doesn't run somehow, there will be many people running, I mean dozens running, like they had dozens of Democrats last time. And then you're going to have a couple of people who run who want to pretend that Trump never happened. Just like take that chip out of everybody's head. Those five years, uh -huh, never happened. There's gonna be four or five candidates like that and they're going to say, that's the anti-Trump lane. It's going to be like a bike path, and they're all going to be squeezed into it. It's not roomy enough to make a difference. But I think the policy legacy, and as I said, the way of doing things that people say, I, I want his policies, not his personality. What does that mean? You don't want a strong leader? You don't want somebody who made a decision and stuck with it? What were Putin and Xi Jinping and Iran doing exactly when Donald Trump was there versus what they're doing now? So I think also when people say don't put him in, I think the media don't want the rematch. Normally they would love a rematch. They don't want the rematch because they see how weak their guy Biden is. And uh, who knows where the Hunter, La Hunter laptop will take us. We're just starting on that journey of hell. So um, I think that Trump, it is, you know, people say, is it Donald Trump's party? Donald Trump recasts the party. He transformed the way that we talk about these issues. And whether you like him or not, agree with him or not, statistically, you're better off with him. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Conway. Thanks for joining us at UW-Whitewater. 
Uh, my question is this. Obviously, when you ran President Trump's campaign, it was a conservative campaign, but you wanted people of all backgrounds to vote for you. So what was your strategy to court independents and specifically liberal voters to vote for President Trump? It's a great question. So we did a couple of things. One, first and foremost, was out of necessity, but it worked. We had 50% digital social media ads and 50% traditional television ads. We were under-resourced and understaffed. We had to do that, but it turned out that that was a great strategy because we had many people who use technologies or native tongue, who rely upon the digital world for news and information, including politics, sort of inundating them that way with the messages. We also did not sort of curate our messages for different audiences. So people would say, well, what are you going to say to women? What are you going to say to Hispanics? What are you going to say to independents and liberals? The same thing. Because if you're sure that China's eating our lunch and we have shipped our jobs and our wealth overseas for far too long, that if you're sure of that, say it wherever you go. If it's not important to you, you'll, you won't hear that part. You'll hear the next paragraph. But if it's important to you and you happen to call yourself a liberal or you're a registered Democrat, you may say, you know what? And nobody else is saying that. Can he really do that? And I think the other thing was recognizing that Donald Trump, for a lot of his life, was a Democrat. For a lot of his life, was pro-choice. For a lot of his life, well, most all of his life, until he was 70, wasn't in politics. And it made other people feel there was a little bit of symbiosis there, a little bit more than they might with a, like a straight-up Republican who had come up through the ranks and had all these elected positions. Donald Trump was seen first and foremost as what? not a Republican, not a conservative, a businessman, and a little bit of a TV star, which helped. But nobody's going to vote for him for that reason. They're going to know him for that reason. But he was, he was looked upon as somebody who can fix stuff, who can solve problems, who can make stuff happen. And so when he said, I'm going to fix stuff and, and solve problems and make stuff happen, you're like, you probably will. I've seen you do it before. And if you can do it in a 44-minute episode, you could probably do it in 44 months in Washington. So I think it was very much that way. And I also think it's just the, it's again, the authenticity. People thought Hillary was very fake, very contrived. They didn't, tr they didn't think she was honest and trustworthy. And they thought Trump was what you see is what you get. You know what he never uses? Conversation fillers. You ever hear Donald Trump say, ah, uh, you know, like, I mean, listening to Hillary and Obama, by the way, it's like texting with a teenager. It's like, ah, uh, like... He doesn't use them because he just keeps talking through them. And that's just very real and very raw to people. And it mattered. The other thing is you don't need to get a majority of people who were against you, a, a majority that were against you last time. You need to get smaller, you know, smaller numbers of that. But I think for Donald Trump, it was taking, it was judges, it was taking on trade, it was taking on immigration, manufacturing. It was really saying to union members all across this country, all of whom, I mean, every a uh, cousin of mine is in a union in the Philadelphia area, New Jersey area. Uh, we, I grew up around that. But really going to them and saying, you know what? They're not for you. I'm for you. I mean, he did very well doing that. So it could be done again. Unfortunately, it wasn't done in 2020. I wasn't involved in that one. Thank you. Yes? Next. Thank you for coming to speak to UW-Whitewater. And I'm just curious, how many um, votes do you think Trump really got in 2020? <laughs> so, I don't know. It says 74 million. That's a lot of votes. It's a, most votes that any president has ever gotten. You know, President Trump has never, ever said he thinks, he, I don't think he has said, I shouldn't say never, ever said. He rarely, if ever, says he got more votes. He just says, have you seen this guy? Do you think he could find the 81 million people to admit that they voted for him? That's a slightly different question about Biden. Um, I will tell you this, because Wisconsin was ground zero for it. And I'm going to commend a new movie to you, Rigged 2020. It's a great movie. You can download it, I think, for $4 or $5. It's called Rigged 2020. Dave Bossy and Citizens United put it forth. Um, yes, I'm in it a little bit. Donald Trump's in it. A lot of folks are in it. New Gingrich. But here's why I want you to watch it, because it really puts all of this in a different light. For me, it talks about Zuck Bucks, but it comes with receipts, $419 million, basically a half a billion dollars all told, going through two groups and under the guise of COVID saying, we want to make sure that people can access the polls and vote um, safely. I think that's a great idea. I think that's wonderful. Thank you for doing that. 
But why in the world did the money go to precincts that went 92% for Biden? Did you not want the rest of us to be safe? You know, so when you dig into this, you see, I've told the president, when I watched that movie, I told him face to face in my log, I said, he said, what'd you think of the movie? And I said, well, I watched it three times now and I learned something new every time. I'm surprised you won Mississippi. And the reason I said that to him was, I feel like the fix was in in so many places that they weren't even paying attention to. And I think 2020 should be, I can't say will be, because only if we're not stupid, should be, should be an outlier because we had more people voting in more ways over more time than ever before. And that was COVID compelled. Yes, that we can't codify those measures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I think the problem is. Why do we no longer have election day? Why is this a hard thing for you to go and vote on election day? What? Election day starts two months early and it goes three weeks later, still counting votes. You got to do what Ohio and Florida did. You have those early votes tallied up, you add them to the day of vote, and you report the results on election day, not election trimester, election year, because that's just, that just opens it up to way too many questions. So um, I'm not surprised that Donald Trump got 12 million more votes the second time, and I'm not surprised that he has the highest vote count for any president in American history. That's what I'll say. Thank you. And then this will be the last question. Hi, Kellyanne. I'm Ryan. Thank you Hi. for coming here today. Um, I actually have a personal goal. I have shaken hands with a lot of big political figures in my day. I've... Come on down. Cool. All right. <laughs> Just you. All right, brings us to the next question. That one was really fast. Um, thank you for coming to Whitewater. Really appreciate it. Um, you were very much involved in the 2016 campaign, um, and I know you had a little bit less of a role in the 2020 campaign. My question for you is if you were more involved in the 2020 campaign, do you think you would have won this state? This state, de definitely Wisconsin, yes. Definitely, yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And not because of me, not because of me. Some of us would have suggested that the president hew very closely to what he did in 2016. It worked, and he can do that and have that amazing record of accomplishments as president. I mean, I frankly think, but for COVID and some other things, 2020 should have been Reagan 84. You know, he won, I mean, he won every state except Walter Mondale's Minnesota and the District of Columbia, but something close to that anyway. And uh, I think it's a shame because people had him going to Oregon, going to Minnesota, going to... Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need... This isn't, this isn't the most elaborate thing you're ever going to tackle in your life. I'm telling you that. I wish I could tell you. I tackled the most elaborate thing. It was cool. It's heady. I'm, I'm glad. Love the history. But guess what? You just look at it and you know what you need to do and where you need to go. By the end of 2016, we had been looking at 64 counties. And I write this in the book... Here's the deal, out soon, um, on sale now. I write this in the book about how John Carl, the uh, White House correspondent or whatnot for ABC News, we were on a phone call with all of ABC and I had um, two other people in the office and I said, hey, we were looking at, it's two days before election, Sunday and election day is gonna be Tuesday. I said, we were looking at 64 counties all along. We're now down to 36. And we and John Carl said, can I have a list of those? And I said, I'll send it to you on Wednesday after we win. And you can hear the people at ABC laughing. I mean, they had to hit the mute. They're like, where's the mute button? Because we're, hee hee hee. So of course, we're still laughing. But um, focusing on counties is how we focused on states. And we saw what Hillary wasn't doing. So we went and did it. Necessity is a mother of invention. I wouldn't have had him going to these places where I think people had other clients and wanted him to be too that he ended up losing significantly. Wisconsin is Wisconsin. You're known as the swing state, the bellwether for a reason. I've known that forever. I was here 22 years ago doing a focus group with ABC News. I was here many times with Major League Baseball was a client of mine forever when Bud Seelig was the commissioner. I, I know this is a swing state. So the other thing is I would have, I think it would have been more I think the president would not have been saying things to suburban women like, hey, suburban housewives, I'm talking to you now. 
I won't let people build in your neighborhood. I mean, we beat the queen bee herself in 2016, did better among women. So I think that, you know, the, the president was underserved. I do. I'm very critical of the 2020 campaign in my book, but I come with receipts. They had $1.4 billion, some of it your money. $1.4 billion. And that record of accomplishments and Joe Biden hanging in, out in his basement. And we're here. I mean, it's so... I think what, ha what was missing in 2020 was the hunger and the swagger and that underdog, underestimated spirit that is Donald Trump. And so you have to, you have to know who you're dealing with. That's who he is, but he also was the president of the United States with all these accomplishments. I think the best message incumbents really have to people, even those who are like, I'm sick of this president. I want to make a change. I want something new. That's fine. But four years isn't really enough to get everything you want out of a president like that, is it? He's just getting started. That alone would have been a good message, I think. But um, it's not just me. It's, it's sort of the rest of the team also that wasn't there. And the president, I'm not a golfer. I'm a bruncher, not a golfer. But the president kept talking about the yips. So anybody in here is a golfer knows the yips. It's like, you're superstitious. And he kept saying, I kept talking about the yips. I'm like, quick somebody, what does that mean? And he was saying, like, I want everything to be the same. I want everything to be like it was, you know, like what I'm used to. And uh, we probably should have abided that a little bit more. But you don't hear from any of the top people from his 2020 campaign, do you? Where are they? I mean, they're rich, but where are they? No, I appreciate that. But no, it, but it's very curious. They're never out there. They're never out there talking to you what went wrong, what went, how to improve it in 2024, um, but in the book, I sort of, I smoke them out from hiding a little bit. Yeah. So we can win again. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, winners. God bless you. Thank you.